The Cassandalese booked passage on a merchant ship from the city of Catapesh in the south to Opara, some 600 miles to the north, in a whole different world. It cost nearly everything she had left, even though the android didn't require any board, and it marked the first time her feet had ever left dry land, though after her first day out on the inner sea, she saw that that wasn't true. Some other Cassandali, hundreds of years before, had crossed these very waters, a shorter journey and hundreds of miles to the west to be precise, but she could remember it as if it had happened to her. Days passed on the sea and the two trips began to blend. It was subtle at first, she found herself getting lost below decks, suspecting a hall where there were stairs, expecting to find her bunk but stumbling into a locked door instead. It was as if she was living the two trips at the same time, like the ships kept swapping themselves on her, and the experience only grew more intense as the day stretched on and the ship itself was her only landmark. The crew grew unfamiliar and strange, their expressions confused, as if they did not expect to see her walking the decks. She could not remember their names. She saw the kindly face of a man who'd let her book passage south from Agorian for next to nothing, but it wasn't right. She could no longer fix herself in time. The past was more real than the present. On the eighth day at sea, Cassandalee did not emerge from her bunk. She no longer felt safe venturing out into the ship itself, even as the other voices in her head implored her. She had duties to do, after all. She'd agreed to operate some kind of punk, to take long, grueling shifts. Hadn't she? She didn't even know where a pump would be but they would throw her overboard if she neglected her duties. Except she paid good money, real gold. She had no duties on the ship, she was a passenger. She stared at the ceiling and told herself over and over that she was a passenger, that she was sailing for the Silver Mountain. Imagining that colossal wreck was the only thing that seemed to help. After 11 days, the journey was through and the ship docked in a new place, a genuinely new place. All of the people who lived inside her quieted just a moment after she stepped out onto dry land. For a little while, at least, Cassandra Lee was free. This is Pot Against the Machine. Welcome back to Pot Against the Machine, the only Pathfinder actual play that wakes up its best friend in the middle of the night with a friendly bite on the face. I'm your host, and here's everybody. It's not friend behavior. I frequently wake up my best friend with a friendly bite on the face. I don't know what you're talking. I guess I'm not a podcast individually, though, so. All right. Well, you're part of the podcast, so those all count for us. Is that Izzy, or is that just Kingsley speaking inside of your skin? Mm. I feel like that's a very cat thing to say. True. She does love a face bite. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Let's see, last week on the program, which was definitely only a week ago, our party, after defeating the color out of space, uh, finished up exploring the color-blighted cave where they found the remains of the last of um, the race's party in the sort of basement where the color had burst out of in the first place. Looked like it was a half-elf magus who unfortunately crumbled into ash like so many other color blooded things upon contact. Did have some some pretty cool stuff, a spell book, uh, some a magic sword, and a, a robo jack, which can apparently be used to control robots. After that, the party uh, made their way out of the swamp and back to Peter's orchard uh, to rest for the night. And uh, while they were taking their watches, things were pretty uneventful at first until Levi, who uh, knew a special trick to keep watch, uh, decided to wake Tarazi up with a bite in the face. And uh, that set off a little bit of a crisis where the party had to wake from sleeping and unarmored and prone on the ground, had to fight against the largest member of the snake squad. Um, obviously they did not want to kill Levi, but Levi was being quite unreasonable until he got hit with a dispel manage, which 
dispelled the magic jar effect that a Buddha was using to control him. Then with the uh, ghost-like being exposed, the party finally had somebody to actually fight against, and they dispatched the Buddha with um, a not insignificant amount of, of effort. He did some damage before he went down, but finally, uh, it's the middle of the night, the ghost is gone, Levi is no longer under the control of the undead and seems to have a shadow again, and that's where we are now. Well, I think as we're sort of in this weird kind of state where the party woke up from a deep sleep and had to very strangely fight one of their own and, of course, eventually figure it out, but still rather high-stress situation. As everybody's kind of, you know, processing the fallout of this and, and maybe trying to get back to sleep, why don't we go around the table, have just a little bit of a, a check-in with each member of the party, because it's been a little while since we've gotten a look into your psyches and see, like, yeah, you've been in the Scar of the Spider for a few days, you've repelled a couple alien invasions, and some pretty terrible stuff happened to you. Any volunteers to go first? Yes. And, uh, I don't think Alan is really gonna say anything out loud, but I think he's mainly thinking about I think the part that's really hit him the hardest is uh, Lurich, the uh, Migo priest in his group, just because despite being like horrifying fungus bug people, they remind him a lot of the colony of where he used to live and like a similar thing, like these people, he's like they're worshipping St. Gosby, they're but they remind him of a time in his life where maybe the best people were not in charge in his community and they made similar mistakes that he saw them on the way to making. And he kind of feels like I think that he's failed twice now at this point. Uh, first time in his past because he, despite being like sort of like this figurehead that he was supposed to be, he didn't really have the actual power to get anybody to not do something that ended up being very dumb and this time because he attempted to talk down Lurich so that we didn't have a big fight and have to kill all of them and failed at that so I think he's thinking of that just as like another failure and I think he's kind of very still sad over that even though it's well actually it's only been like a day and a half so it really has not been that long at all but uh, I think, yeah, he's just kind of sitting, ruminating on that kind of quietly. He probably doesn't look as, like, just kind of pleasant as he normally looks. Like, usually, especially at night, like, he'll kind of be humming to himself and looking at the sky and smiling and stuff. He just seems much more drawn in tonight instead. Kicking himself for not taking up Lurhedge's offer and, and joining him and in, in killing the party. <laughs> Somebody has to go second. Okay. So, Tarazi, uh, he joined up with this group of adventurers with the motivation of taking down the Technic League. And so far, he's he's only encountered one contractor and one member's brain. Uh, he almost died in the swamp, fighting a color blighted frog hemoth, which wasn't great. Uh, he just had to fight his best friend who was possessed by a Buddha uh, also not great uh, so on the one hand like Pater's farm and the weird vegetables uh, repelling alien invasions color out of space I mean that was cool for a couple days and the novelty is kind of wearing off now uh, but on the other hand he has like really grown to, to think of Rixby, Kira, and Alwyn as friends, not just traveling companions. It's been uh, eventful. He hasn't even been at the party for a week. <laughs> uh, and even Asuma, as quiet as she is, is a literal alien from space, so she's pretty cool. <sighs> Overall, uh, Tarazi would rate the adventure itself uh, one star, but his companions as four stars, so bringing the 
two and a half star kind of average. Uh, he would love to just go hop in the Halic and burst through the gates of Starfall and run his Nullblade through Osman Zido and see what happens next. Uh, but in the meantime, he'll just hope not to die. I'll go. Kira, I think before getting back to sleep, is actually going to armor up fully and just do some cleave practice on, I guess, local plots of compost. Because... I don't know, gardeners, correct me if I'm wrong, but com- like chainsaws can't hurt compost, right? It's all broken down already. Turn it anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good for it. It aerates it. There we go. Mm-hmm. It's, it's helping out. Remember to chainsaw your compost <laughs> if you haven't recently. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to chainsaw your compost. Let's get that on a tote. <laughs> yeah, Kira's going to do some quick, just, just, just a little wind-down training. The last time we checked in with her training, I think she was learning... Um, canonically cleave from her mother which she has not yet gotten to put into practice and is so excited about doing at some point when we're not fighting a troop more practically she's been picking up some more magic she's also very excited to show off all of these spells she's just been storing i think i'm gonna say mostly learning from brixby because there's a surprising amount of overlap there um and even though she doesn't get the methods that he uses i think he is good enough with his words that he can describe it in such a way that she can sort of figure it out. So she's learned a few new spells from him. She's learned some things from her mom. She's really determined to keep this party safe because as she was just reminded, uh, she has failed to do that a few times. We just saw, we were underground and saw the body of this dead half orc. And she had kind of a moment there um, where she was taken back to Parda back like on the first day she met everyone um, and saw her, best friend dead underground and has sort of had this like I think we said we like she stepped forward to go collect the body and it just sort of crumbled into dust and she was like ah. and that's been a really emblematic um, of her time with the party is trying to keep her friends alive and safe and whole and just failing and failing and failing and learning new things every time she's like okay maybe with this spell or maybe with this sword action I can I can keep my friends safe and it just hasn't worked so far um she also recently got swallowed by a frog which she wasn't a huge fan of but was able to eh, she recovered from that pretty okay I think her her brain is really like in this place of what else can I do and I think as she sort of winds down her little um cleave practice on the compost she's going to go over to Brixby say hey Brix um, sorry, I know it's late. I just wanted to come see if you were hungry for goo tubes. Uh, the people in legal have told us that we actually always have to answer in the affirmative, um, no matter what, when that question is posed. So that's in and out of character as well. Um, that, a, that a threat to our families. Of course, Kira, I am always hungry for goo tubes, TM. Um... Yeah, I, uh, you see he's kind of got his, like, spell book and a couple other spell books and ripped out pages kind of, um, spread around him in the way that you were talking about magic. It's like, I am just looking at all of this. Uh, this one's mine. He points to the one spell book. That one came from Marrow. Do you remember that? I remember. Then, yeah, that one over there is Zhao. And, you know, it's hard. It's, it's sometimes I. Who's going to carry my spellbook, right? Like. You're going to carry your spellbook. I hope so. I mean. No, you are. Okay. Well, I mean, I remember standing in Phrasma's queue. And I remember. I don't know how to describe it. It's like a golden hook of what felt like love that could embrace, that pulled me back. But there is a time, big stuff, that we all meet the Grey Lady. There's no hook. And, you know, it's just, it's got me thinking about what we've brought, what we've carried. You know, it's not just this, these pieces of the people we've killed. We've all done that. You remember that black card that Vargas always spun? 
The one that he took off a Technic League agent. Yeah. But I, it's not, it's the things that we carry beyond that, like the, the duty. I think about Asher and I think about the letter. There's a long line of gunslingers that, that held it as a token and, and how, they how he took it and his gun from another dead man and carried it. And, and, and now we carry it. It's like you carry Pada and we carry Nemgeta to Mora. It's just so much, it's so heavy. I know we can share it. And I know we've picked up good things too. But it's it just has me thinking a lot about, you know, what it is that we're carrying. Bricks, if something happens, I I need you to tell my mom that I love her and give her this letter and she'll like reach in her pocket and take out just a stack of papers that she has been carrying. This is for her. And there's another one, too, for... I don't really know who. I I think maybe Vargas might have, or he could have helped me figure it out, but I don't know if we'll... Anyway, um, and she'll take out another piece of paper that's like a scroll that has just been continually wound and rewound. So, this is for my, my other mom. I don't know how you'll know her. I don't know how I'll know her, but... If something happens and I don't come back, I I think it's important that you carry this. And I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to give you more things to carry. I don't want to do that, Rix, but I... Maybe let's make a deal, okay? I'll take your spell book. You take these letters. And neither of us get left underground. No one here. Neither of us get left underground. And then they hug. There is a, maybe like a, a grouping. It's like one of those hugs that, that has a magnetic field that attracts other huggers. It just draws everyone It's a hug nucleus. If, I don't really know. I mean, again, I, with respect to Alowen and Tarazi's vibe, um, especially getting bit multiple times. <laughs> Like, recently you may not be in the most, like, let's constrict each other mutually. <laughs> Episode title. But it, yeah, just uh, appreciate you all in and out of game. Whew. Sky medals. <laughs> just around. Sometimes it works. <laughs> Wow. Now remember we have to lob we have to lob Don't predictions at <laughs> the future. That's true. Yeah, that we got I've got to drop them in the uh We gotta get more people to donate or not donate them dedicate yeah, that, That's them. a full on GM embargo on Sky Metals until we hear more dedications. <laughs> we suffer. Characters <laughs> will die. <laughs> Their fictitious blood is on your hands. Over and over. <laughs> <laughs> I think as um, as this conversation is going on and and the subsequent hug, no matter how many people join it, I this Asuma I don't think does join the hug. She is sitting off to the side and she's got like her little dagger out and she's just carving, uh, like whittling away at a stick and and watching everyone and just sort of sitting there, um, on her own. I mean, it makes sense. I assume we're having the conversation in common. So she yes. <laughs> just sees us talk for a little bit and then suddenly everybody starts hugging. Wow, that's, that seems that seems The only weird. word she recognized was Gucci because it's like a, a lone word from Androthen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's the universal that's language it. of Gutu. Yeah. So I think... Um, now everybody can, however long it takes, get back to sleep and go back to the, the watch rotation, such as it is. I don't really remember who's gone already, but at the same time, I'm, I'll be up front with the fact that I'm not going to spring another encounter on you tonight. So the watches, they, they go forth um, 
uneventfully. Everybody can get their sleep and regain their spells and uh, abilities. And uh, eventually morning comes probably later than you'd normally get up just because of the interruption and how hard it probably was to get back to sleep. So dawn has come on the 4th of Lamashan, if I'm not mistaken. You know what I'm going to do first thing in the morning? Um, if it was real life, I'd roll over and immediately do connections. But instead, I'm going to do the, the, <laughs> the, the uh, Numerian alternative. I'm, I'm going to do the goo cube. We're going to hit cube. that cube. <laughs> <Yes>. Numerian connections. <laughs> Numerian connections. I like to imagine, like, each of the eight faces is, like, a different <laughs> New York Times puzzle game. <laughs> it's incredible that the New York Times actually got connections into this adventure path. <laughs> Only paid us one year's subscription worth 50% off. Again. For one of us. To Join be our Discord. Discuss connections. All right. Here we go. Okay. So I roll uh, an 11 on top of my six to beat the DC 10. So today I am rewarded with delicious, nutritious paste. Tastes like compost. Tastes like compost. <laughs> it's it's oh. definitely kind of, I mean, to get like a reusable, because they usually have the like tomes of whatever, right? That give you like a plus two or a plus four for in like later stages in Adventure Paths. But this is one that can be reused. So I understand it, but you also have to hit like five successive rolls and it's just like odds at that point, even with a relatively high intelligence mod. Um, I, it is definitely, yeah, I mean, they, there's a reason they don't make it easy, but we can all get smart eventually. I just have to get smart in the first place. So are we like Q-Cuban? Teleporting, shopping, coming back to the square of the spider all armed up. <clears throat> or are we just going to go uh, knock on Binox's door and be like, hey, want to kill Dominion? Knock, knock, knocking on Binox's door. Sorry. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I'd love to, like, I think one uh, great, great Clapton reference, right? Yeah. Is that the. Mm hmm. Cool. Yeah, I honestly don't even know. Questionable man, find find music. Okay, yeah, maybe we like roll to the machine cave, reserve the teleport in case like someone is hit with an irreparable status or something that we have to not to be too meta, but it's kind of good to hold on to those. And we do eventually have to go back there, sell some more stuff, and maybe enchant Levi's mouth, get that magic mouth. Yeah. Also, we want to get our steps in. Mm -hmm. That's true. Or discs and no. Or discs. Or or slithers. IDK how how a Fitbit works when on a snake. It's a real problem for the snake community, I think. The Fitbits just yeah. don't accurately reflect their motion. Honestly, it's we don't um, talk about it enough. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've got we've got space for a solid, I don't know. 30, 40 minute conversation about snakes and Fitbits. If you guys want to jump into it, I think we could round that out. I was going to say, I was like, oh, oh, oh it's a silly yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. We got all the emotional stuff out at the top so we can just coast from here. <laughs> so the party, I think um, your way over to the machine cave, you know the way now. And uh, obviously, Asuma knows the way she used to live there. She can tromp over and it's doesn't take all that long. Um, and eventually, um, you've crossed the Scar of the Spider back up to the the old machine cave on the northern side. Jero did raise uh, a good... Did we get like a, a little little natty crudite this morning? Um, did you want to indulge in any of um, the mm. fine vegetables? Drowsy would eat an apple. I think I heard Tarazi is eating an apple. Um, Apples the, plus four on all radiation-based effect saves for 24 ooh, that's hours. That's probably a good one. Oh, I do like uh, that. Can you, can you bounce me a d20? 
Just doing the thing. Six, oh. he dies. Uh, can you roll a fortitude save? Because this apple doesn't taste great. <laughs> it's a babble. How about a nat one, Sam? Yeah, you don't feel so good. Um, Tarazi is sickened for the next 12 hours as the spoiled apple <clears throat> just, it just goes down wrong. Neat. <laughs> Kira sees this and is like, I'm also going to have an apple. <laughs> All right, why don't you bounce me a d20? Ooh, Sam, that's a three. I should make a fortitude save. I should use a different dice. I should use a different dice. Die? Die. Sam, that's a two. Oh, no. But wait. <laughs> What's but the plus, total? Oh, yeah. Hang plus on. 97. Yeah. Two plus 14. Is it two plus 14 or 14 total? Two plus 14. 16. Ah, you're fine. Ah, great. Okay. Can, it it tastes it. terrible, and you don't feel any benefits, but um, you're not sick. Okay, I'll take it. I knew a nat one was like the only thing I could roll to fail, so naturally. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it, the DC's not um, not staggering. Alowin not learning anything from watching both of these two <laughs> eat this apple and then immediately become violently ill is also going to have one. All right. Ah, uh, D20. Oh, that's not great. Uh, it's fortitude, you said? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, well, what what number oh, did you get uh, your D20? I got a five. So I'm assuming I'm making the roll. <laughs> uh, yeah, fortitude. These are bad apples. You have to eat an apple, Brixby. I'm gonna. <laughs> you know I'm gonna. I got a 15 on that, though. So I got a 23 on my fort save. All right, so you're fine. It tastes terrible. It's, it's nowhere near as good as the belt fruit, but... So, one by one, the crew takes an belt apple, fruit. bites into it, vomits, and then we all look expectantly at Brixby. I like to imagine we're just passing the same apple. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, ew, yeah. You gotta yeah, taste 23 this. 23 versus peer pressure, you know I'm rolling that D20. <laughs> it's a 15. Oh, hey. Hey. Nice. Brixby gets a good apple. <laughs> I all just like bit the wrong. There's like a worm that extends from one quarter all the way to the other two quarters. This side's tasty though. So that is a plus four bonus on all saving throws against radiation effects for the next 24 hours for Brixby, and no one else gets any benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and speaking of the save against radiation effects, I think uh, as we're approaching uh, Binox Cave, Alowin will use the uh, extend rod to cast uh, Delayed Poison Communal, the way it's got to be staggered. I think we each get two hours, and uh, what's-her-face, Izuma gets one. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And after all those preparations and that wonderful breakfast... Where Brixby is just having a wonderful day. He had good paste. He had a good apple. And everybody else is having a rough start, I think. You have arrived back at the machine caves. And you can see from the outside that um, rotting husk of a Nethal goo is still propped up in there. It's a shame we don't have, like, gentle repose. It'd be nice to keep that bad boy husking. So, Asuma, do you have any, like, I know you had, like, a tempestu uh, tempestuous relationship with your roommate, but, like, any advice? Um, Binox is a very strange machine, I would say. No matter what you actually think of it, pretend that you were very impressed. And, um, you should be fine. Um, I found that... He he, it doesn't tend to remember me from one meeting to the next. So, um, if things go wrong, we could just leave and come back, and it might be like it had never seen us before. Well, that's fortunate, as we did slaughter a bunch of its compatriots, or whatever its relationship is to the mannequins. Yeah, that's true.
we've gained a level since we recovered the memory facet that should help robots, but I don't think we knew the full extent of what it does. Would we be able to re-roll on that to see? Because what I'm wondering is, hey, can we stick this in Binox and then his memory is fine now? And then he's like, let's kill the Dominion. Um, I mean, you could roll an engineering on the memory facet. Hop on that, because Jeff is so smart. We got a nat one for 24. Yeah, buddy. Second, but a 28 total. Um, With the 28 total, I think you would say, you would think that it depends really on if Binox has a port for memory facet. Not all robots um, have the capacity to have one installed. But the facet that you have, I think that Tarazi is able to determine that he knows what kind of facet it is, and I will be able to tell you as soon as I find it on Nemgetters. Oh, it is a compassion facet. (laughs) I know some people that could use those. (laughs) So a compassion facet specifically allows um, a robot or an AI to understand and even experience love and associated emotions, imparting a bonus to will saves and granting a bonus to diplomacy and sense motive checks and cre- can create the ability to form strong emotional bonds with um, creatures around it, something that normally escapes machines. Oh, let's manipulate him into <laughs> fighting with us. <laughs> so yeah, we just got to act all impressed and be like, wow, what a cool model. How many ports you got, <laughs> my guy? You're so strong. And be like, oh, I've got one right here. All right, let's go look at them ports. Then we kill him and take the facet back. Once he's done our dirty work. Rixby and Halla win the two tanks heading in first. Mm -hmm. As is tradition. Oh, I forgot about those little guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's the little torturer robot that um, Tarazi set up as a bomb (laughs) has been detonated, notably. Oh, awesome. Well, thankfully, he probably won't remember that we did that either. Um, As you come back into the room where the uh, mannequin robots were last time, uh, as you cross into this area, you see one, two, three, four dead mannequin robots. You also see there were six um, dead mannequin robots. And instead, there are now two standing robots that look like the mannequin robots with their heads removed and those murder balls, the torture robots clumsily installed on top of them. These things, despite their slipshod construction, appear to be mobile and they appear to be um, hostile as they move to attack. I only never want to roll for initiative. Can we gently punch them into submission? Who knows? All right. How about um the soft broken bricks be? It's uh it's the wheel. I got a twenty on this roll for a twenty eight. All right, nice and speedy. How about the fervent Tarazi? Well, in case listeners don't know, sickened also impacts your initiative roll, so Looking at a 12 for only a 13. All right. And the commanding Kira. I have a plus seven now. That's fun. Uh, 15 plus seven, 22. That's pretty quick. And the unrelenting Alwyn. The unrelenting Alwyn rolled a four. So he's switching dice. Uh, So that is an 11 total. All right. So we will begin combat with uh, Brixby up first. Brixby is going to take a five foot step uh, to the east, uh, putting him in line with Kira and uh, still in line of sight to the horrific amalgamation to the north. Brixby is going to level his finger and shoot out Scorching Ray. I do know that only one of these I will be getting sneaky doodles on. So I'm going to roll... 
three scorching rays. And these are all against, again, the northern one. Um, so against touch, that is a 24, a 25, and a 23. Uh, those will all hit flat-footed touch. Right. Do you need um, any of these separate? Like the fire separate, the sneak attack separate? Uh, no, you can roll it all up. Um, so, okay. That is uh, 34 fire damage, 22 sneak attack. Dang. That's a lot of damage. That, that is... Uh, is there anything I can roll knowledge-wise on this? Or is it just like, you got some torture robot in my mannequin? No, you got some mannequin in my torture robot. I mean, that does appear to be approximately the deal uh, <laughs> that you're looking at. Uh, you can roll in engineering. Um, I think you already know some about these things. Alrighty. Why not... Nothing for knowledge is today. I have now progressed to a two for a twenty-five on my knowledge engineering. Well, it's it's. I would say it's a a torture mannequin. Uh, you can tell um, that it's those two forms of robots put together rather sloppily. It's probably not super hardy compared to either one, but it can probably also do a lot of damage. If you'd like to ask one question. Ooh, they normally have weaknesses. Do they have a weakness? Uh, they are vulnerable to both critical hits and electricity. Sick. Okay, so Bixby's going to share that. Uh, they they are vulnerable to electricity, just like I think it was the torture robots that were. Um, they're like a torture mm-hmm. robot mannequin. They're a to 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 can to to can anyway. Electricity. That's my turn. All right. So I think the next one up is the fearless Torchkin robot, and it happens to be standing right next to Asuma, so it's going to beat the snot out of her. Um, We're going to start with a rotating blade. Yeah, and that's going to hit her. That is not a ton of damage. Next one also hits... Third one also hits. Fourth one also hits. And then two slammy doos. Because it also has those big robot arms. And, uh, yeah. Total of six hits on Asuma. Not great for her. Not a huge amount of damage. But, no, oh, she got... She got chopped up by a torture robot. And now Kira is up. Uh, she got chopped up by this torture robot right here. Yeah, the the southern one. Excellent. Here is going to take a five foot step in front of Brixby and uh, rage, and then as a free action, because you get multiple of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a free action, we'll uh, go ahead and do a come and get me, which she will trigger by saying, "Leave my friends alone." And uh, that gives you a four a plus four bonus attack on me um, until the beginning of my next turn. And then also she's going to hit it with a chainsaw. She saw Brixby attack it, so now it's done. Ooh, that's not a great roll. That is still a uh, 32. Yeah, 32 will hit. Okay, 32. Um, and she just did a five-foot step so I can full attack, right? Yep. Uh, 29, right? Yeah. Yeah, 29, 26. Yep. And, oh, nice, 25. Yeah, that hits exactly. Excellent. Let's do four smashes with chainsaw. Roll three times four. 12d6, is that right? 12d6. That's Plus. entirely too many. Plus 25 times 4, which is 100. <laughs> oh, 141 points of chainsaw damage at this guy that just attacked my good, good friend, Asuma. Well, it doesn't all go through, but it is still a lot more than the total HP of the Torchikin robot. So it is dead. And as a reminder, you have a plus four to attack me for the next little, little junction here. Okay, so Asuma's going to shoot you a few times <laughs> on her turn, I think. Fair. That's, I opened myself up to that. That's my turn. 
Right, I think that she is going to, since Alwyn's kind of in the way there, jog up to the north and take one shot on the Torturekin robot. She will hit with the ice and do a little chunk of damage. The grouchy Torturekin robot is still up, though, and that is Snake Squad time. All right. This sure looks like a construct to me. What gave it away? Uh, two robots duct taped together. So, we're gonna just gonna stride on through 5, 10, 15. Full complement of movement just to get up here in case it lives long enough to be flanked. Because uh, I do only get a single attack with that full move, but it is with a construct bane weapon. Ah, you do pass through a threatened square to get there. Hasn't acted yet. Oh, that's true. That one didn't act. Mean. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. And it never will. <laughs> it never will. Uh, that meets beats then, because that's a 25 exactly to hit. Uh, that is only 26 points of damage. That is enough to finish off the grouchy Torchigan robot. Everyone okay. quick, pretend you didn't do it. Oh no, someone broke these. <laughs> oh, I'm so upset about this. If only I could find the person who uh, did this. No, oh, no. Hope nobody gets really mad and shows us their ports. <laughs> I, I had a, I have a, uh, a spell that may have been able to have avoided this if I hadn't rolled a four. Too bad, they're giving up the magic <laughs> smoke now. That's what I envision every time we beat a construct is the, like, blue puff. You're like, oh yeah, they're done. Take a look at these. It's probably fine. He'll pro probably just sort of mash those two together into one big one next time. Yeah, that's something about a build a better mousetrap. Irony isn't lost on me. So, oh, because of how? Yeah, yeah, the whole. Mm -hmm. He eats a comically large piece of cheese. So, <laughs> who is going to? Excuse me, this is delicious. Who is going to speak to Binox? Maybe Alwyn. I vote Alwyn. I can try. Did we ever get that trapped door open? No, I don't think no. we did. I mean, I know Binox probably isn't in there, but we don't know what is. Yeah, that trap door is uh, still closed. You also didn't explore to the north of the, the trap door. Let's get in there. Uh, hold on a sec. Brixby is going to cast RMZ's focus on himself off the wand. Put a tick on there. 11 out of 20 charges used. And he is going to put out his trap feelers, his Brixby sense. Uh, this door, does it still look trapped? And by this door, I mean the one that has shocked us multiple times and nearly killed us. Yeah, the big uh, Glaukite, Glaukite door um, that did some real damage to y'all. I mean, it looks just the same as it was before. All right, excellent. So Brixby, um, constantly striving to be better and also play his intelligence modifier um, or his intelligence, uh, I guess, attribute better, uh, is going to uh, checking that the, the door is in fact still trapped. So Brixby moves 30 feet away from the door, um, which puts him kind of on top of Binox's cool art. And he is going to use a, uh, a classic arcane trickster feat and attempt a disabled device using ranged ledger domain at 30 feet away. Hopefully this will keep him outside of the ambit of shocky, shocky murder. Um, but we'll see. Everybody else get like way back, please. Um, and they all have. 
And uh, he's going to attempt a disabled device. Now, this does add five to the DC doing it at range. All right. Let's see, and I'm going to enable, yes, goggles of minute seeing. He turns those on. Um, and he is going to make an attempt. So, all right, yeah, plus five to the normal DC. So that's a 28. Um, so as Brixby is trying to disable the steam jet trap from a uh, safe distance, there's some kind of fumbling involved in this magical, um, his magic rat fingers and the steam jets trigger and that entire room fills up with the superheated water vapor. But luckily nobody's in that room, so nobody gets blasted horribly. Yeah. Alrighty. So we're doing another roll. That is a 35 against the DC plus five. Unfortunately, that also triggers the steam. Oh my goodness. Alrighty, he keeps going. It's a tough door. How many times can you do this a day? Oh, it's it's endless. I could I could oh, literally wow. take twenty. Um, there is there is no limit to range ledger domain. I can do uh, sleight of hand and uh, disable device at thirty feet. Yeah, keep going. My second my second will wear off. Uh, I tried it again and I rolled a fourteen for a thirty nine. That is enough. Oh my God. And on Brixby's fifth attempt to <laughs> defeat this trap, this one from a safe distance, he manages to, like, uncouple hoses inside the door and disable the trap. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. His pores are, like, so open on his face. Like, all that steam is just done. See right into pores. him. Yeah, you can, you can get an echo back from those pores <laughs> if you talk to him. Um, that's a terrible mental image. But yeah, I imagine like ranged ledger domain kind of looks a little bit like Mage Hand or something, right? And it's just a lot of fumbling at a distance. Uh, or like if anyone watches Cutthroat Kitchen, the fantastic show where they sometimes make people cook with the 20-foot utensils, probably feels a little bit like that. Um, all right. It's, uh, I believe it's, it's uh, well, you know, I will just demonstrate. I suppose everyone stay back. And Brixby cracks the door. That's still locked. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> Anticlimactic. And then a second steam <laughs> jet goes off. So, and he, uh, it's another 14, so another 39 against the door. Uh, that is enough to uh, disengage the locks on the um, big Glaukite door, even though, like, it. There wasn't even really a way to access the lock from this side. Like, the whole door, it was built to only open from the other side. So, Brixby had to do some real fancy, like, through the seam kind of manipulation. And up underneath it with, like, a credit card and an unspooled uh, wire hanger. <laughs> but it's his tail <laughs> that goes under the door and just kind of was doing that with the tail blade on there. <laughs> I love that without <laughs> fail... Uh, there will always be Kingsley in, in every app. What are the residuals we're paying your cat for all of their appearance fees at this point? It's like 35%, honestly. <laughs> she gets more than I do. Just really bring that up with legal. Yeah, she's a cat. It's unfortunate because Kingsley is legal. I, I guess we've never really <laughs> told people what the legal department looks like, but... It's a cat. So, uh, yeah, let's all... Uh, go inside so entering into this hallway it sort of takes an immediate right hand turn um, to a 10 foot wide hallway that runs up another uh, 30 feet or so and stops in a, another door this one not nearly so big and imposing as the steam covered one take another peekadoo to see if there are traps on there um, I will roll perception yeah, I only got a four off the dice for a 21 with the school second. It is a 34 if it's high tech and mechanical, 33 if it's not. All right, yeah, I think you're both pretty confident that this door is not trapped. Is it locked? Nope. Asuma, 
Is this the way to Binox, or is he the other way? I, both ways, I think, lead to him, but this should be his uh, chamber. Or its chamber. I'm not clear on the correct way to identify this rope. Certainly. All right, so, like, when we open the door, let's all be like, wow, this is so cool. That's really tasteful wallpaper. This is a really nice cave. Right. Deal. All righty. Into the chamber. And you should just be able to click on the door to open. Oh, wow. It's a real door. Oh. Oh. They've been working on door Boundary. technology. Wow. Ooh, we have door permissions? Awesome. We've always been able to do this. This is just the first doors in this entire room. <laughs> <laughs> so the walls of this impressive chamber are covered with gray metal plates and decorated with flashing lights, pulsating glass panels, and strange mechanical devices. While glowing strips fill the chamber with harsh lighting, the floor is etched with a complex swirling pattern composed of thousands of tiny symbols. Banks of machinery and techn technological workstations fill the area to the north and south, while a large metal panel on the southern wall breaks into a pattern of smaller plates adorning the wall. And you can see, standing in this room about uh, 20 feet in, beyond the large machine, there is a large, complex-looking automaton with multiple arms that end in gripping talons and different tools and um, a segmented body that has four um, kind of spider-like legs, or they, they sort of remind you of the various different uh, machines that have the segmented legs that all come out from like a kind of rounded base. And its head is sort of this weird black helmeted thing with uh, three red lights on it. And this um, creature stands up, and like sort of stretches itself out to be like even taller than it is and it's already much bigger than a person um and it calls out in a grating metallic voice you stand in the presence of the reconstructed one binox the mighty binox the builder the one born of the master unity who has forged one's own realm and seeks to expand the realm to be all realms binox demands your obeisance Having damaged Binox creations, you must volunteer as replacements. Binox will disassemble one of you in payment for your insolence, but allow the others to serve. What say you, little things of gristle and bone? Which of you will pay the price for Binox's mercy? We all step back and leave a Suma in line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Halloween will uh, step forward. Is he speaking common or Andrafen? Andrafen. Okay, so he'll reply back in Andrafen. He'll say, Um, greetings, great Binox. We did not mean to attack your guardians. We came here to meet you, and they attacked us before we could say or do anything. We actually were here in order to enlist your help because we heard of how great and mighty you are, and we need to launch an assault against the horrible creatures that live to the north in the canyon and thought maybe you could help us. Uh, we have also heard that they may be hoarding technology, which should probably rightfully belong to you since it's in this canyon, right? And uh, I'd like to make either a diplomacy or I guess I could technically do a uh, bluff because a couple of that was a little bit uh, stretched. Um, I mean, you could do either one. Uh, let me see which one's higher. I think they're both about the same. Uh, in fact, they're both exactly the same. They're both plus 13. Uh, so that is a 12 on the die for a 25. A 25. So, um, it's very hard to get a read on a <laughs> robot that has no facial expressions but like it's it's not moving to uh disassemble Alwyn or anything um as it stares down at him and says ah you do well little thing of gristle and bone to come to us for assistance we are the mighty Binox. we are the rulers of this land 
But Binox will not be helping you with those scampering creatures. Binox's work is here. This is Binox's place. And there is still the matter of the debt that you owe us. Drowsy would, like, whisper to Alamon, like, Brixby and I could offer to fix them. Mm -hmm. But I think he will say, uh, What about if, instead of disassembling one of us, which would be detrimental if you want us to help you, since we were much better assembled, what if we were able to help you undo some of the damage that we had to do in defending ourselves. Uh, Brixby and Tarazi both know a good deal about technology and could probably help you rebuild your defenders quicker than you could on your own. And were built out of inferior fleshy bits. Come forward. Brimby and... Turglebin. Yes. Yes, I am Brimby. <laughs> yes, Turglebin shall approach mighty Binox. And he'll sheathe the null blade and just, you know, approach. Kira will go stand with Levi. Obeisantly. <laughs> and as, as um, Tarazi steps forward and the giant robot is looking down on him it seems to just be sort of stationary and staring at you but once you get close enough like all of a sudden it'll rear up again and stick like all eight of those arms up in the air and be like Brimby you dare you dare to presume you can fix technology faster than the mighty Binox reclaimer of those that are lost repairer of destroyed technologies we would just um, we would help because you would be spending your time on more important things than just rebuilding, you know, um, your underlings, like your great work. Nah, my work is great. You speak well, Tinkle Bins. Yes. Frimby Tinkle Bins. Tinkle Bins. <laughs> well known. <laughs> He clearly thinks you're you're <laughs> Turtle B and I'm Grim B. Yes, what Turtle Bim said, we can let you focus your attention on your great work and do our best attempts at rebuilding your masterpieces. And uh, Binox sort of scuttlingly turns itself around so it's facing away and it, it folds some of its claw hands behind its back um, like it's um, gazing off into the distance. Um, our work is important. We'll check him for ports. Uh, you can uh, make a perception check, see if you can see any potential ports for the memory facet. Uh, 26. I got a 10 for a 30 for a little cheeky port peak. Unless it's a high-tech or mechanical port. Well, it probably would be high-tech or mechanical. Um, you don't see anywhere obvious that it um, looks like you'd be able to attach this thing. I mean, it, perhaps it could be something internal on the robot or something, but it doesn't look like it has any exposed ports, at least that you can see from here. It says, uh, what shall we do with you interlopers, you presumptuous interlopers? He pauses for a second, like, like like he's lost his train of thought, and he uh, swings back around, looking at all of you with it. Uh, some claws up in the air, and some down, and some crossed. He goes, we demand tribute. We demand... Binox demands treasures. What have you... What have you found in the world outside? What treasures can you give to the mighty Binox to placate our rage? <laughs> and it's shaking claws to, you know, show you the rage. 600 <laughs> silver discs. 100 goo tubes. No, 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 no. Stop. Last time you threw a goo tube down a <laughs> hole, we <laughs> fought a color out of space. And it died! Can you respect the goo tube? We have this beam generator. Clicks on the flashlight and clicks it off. 
clicks it on again and puts it under his chin. Dramatic effect. Kira gasps from behind the wall. <laughs> <gasps> oh. This technology may impress your puny flesh minds, oh. but I, the great Binox, require greater tribute. Look all around you. Look at the wonderful instrumentation we have created. Look at the great technology. Look at the pieces of Unity's world we have been able to establish in this pathetic place. We require parts. We can use your parts. Binox has kind of crept closer. It's got two time-worn sonic pistols, only seven charges each. I mean... Yeah, I mean, we've got some fruity, tooty, point and shooties. Holds up a time-worn pistol. Oh, I think Binox will shoot out a claw arm and, and grab the time-worn pistol and hold it up to its face. Say, ah, this is in terrible condition. No matter... We can repair it. We can repair it. And uh, it, it throws just the gun over its shoulder, like into the back of the room, and it bounces off a wall back there. And I think, how about we do another diplomacy check just to to gauge how we're making an impression on, on our dear friend Binox here. We'll attempt to aid. <laughs> I would also like to aid. I was going to say, can Alowin aid? <laughs> By saying... Oh, mighty Binox. <laughs> or am I doing the main one? Because I haven't really been talking to him for a little bit. But if Sam will <laughs> let me do the main one, <laughs> he will. I aid. Oh. I do not. I'm glad I switched to this die. I don't. Okay, so that is a... Eight is a plus two. Yep. That is a 35 then, because that is a natural 20. <laughs> Wow. Uh, though I have no idea what he says to get that good of a thing. I think maybe he'll just say, uh, uh, Great and mighty Binox, it is true that what you have around here is incredible, what you've been able to build. Uh, I saw in a visit to a place called Scrapwall another uh, being that came from Unity, and what I saw left over of him, though I didn't get to meet them was nowhere near as impressive as what you have. You are truly doing something amazing here and we would like to help you if you're also willing to help us. And again, sorry for attacking your defenses, but they were so powerful that we really didn't have any other choice. Really just kind of buttering them up. Butter and, um, Binax looks down at, at Alwyn and says, Yes, your con contrition pleases us. We may be able to help you. And I'm going to bed. Oh. Night, night Binox. Night Binox. Good night, Binox. Night, Sam. Good night, Binox and Sam. Binox and Sam. Sam and Binox. Good night. Brimby and <laughs> Tingle Loof. Turgle Ben. Turgle Loof. Tattle Tail. It's me in the spotlight losing my contrition. Property of Network Against the Machine LLC, all rights reserved. Pathfinder and the Iron Gods Adventure Path are property of ISO Publishing. See their website for more details. The theme Against the Machine was written and performed by your own Zach. See the show notes for additional music and sound licensing. If you enjoyed the show, we encourage you to leave us a review. Bye. 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 Bye.
The forms of waves. Yeah. Wave form Bonaparte. Turning on audacity. All right, how about now? You good? You good? Audacity. 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 Oakland is Audacity. Little Italy. Bring back my little, little, little. <laughs> Oakland is Little. Boop. I thought you were giving that. I thought you were telling the New York Times to join our Discord. <laughs> join our Discord. New York Times, join our Discord. <laughs> I don't know if the entire New York Times can come into our Discord. That, yeah, no, some of them are not allowed. 